Good morning, everyone. Thank you to Nancy while we did a little last minute preparation there for the communion table. Um, let us begin as we do. It is good to see you all this morning. There's so many of you. And uh, let us begin as we do by sharing uh, the peace. And the way that we do that is peace be with you, or peace be with you, or my peace be with you. And then once you've greeted everyone and offered the sign of the peace and we reconcile ourselves one to another, then there is a prayer and you will offer me peace. All right, let us begin. It looks like you're almost ready. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. And I peace of the Lord be with you always, and you say, and also with you. You may be seated. I'm Reverend Brenda Torrey, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I just want to let you know that this Sunday, we are not celebrating Remembrance Sunday, but next Sunday, Roz Vincent Haven will be here, and she will celebrate along with you. I'm taking a study leave this week to prepare for Advent because it's in two weeks. Your presence here today changes things. It changes the world by the act of inviting God into your heart and your thoughts and back into your community. And we say, Amen. Oh, I should let you know as well that Leslie uh, Litweiler was going to be my liturgist or our liturgist this morning, and she is homesick. Everybody's got the flu or colds, and so you're going to hear a lot of my voice this morning. I hope that's okay. Call to worship. Like flame, heat, and light, like wind, breath, and spirit, like water, moisture, and the quenching of thirst, you are one, O oh God. In the face of who you are, we are left silent and wonderstruck, and we ache to embody in even the smallest way some measure of your integrity in our doing and our speaking and our being. Amen. You may stand and we will sing, Be Thou My Vision, verses 1 to 2 and 4 to 5. That's Voices United, number 642.
You may be seated. Our first reading is from the Psalter, and it is Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithfulness, his faithful love lasts forever. That's what those who are redeemed by the Lord say. The ones God redeemed from the power of their enemies, the ones God gathered from various countries, from east and west, north and south. Some of the redeemed have wandered into the desert, into the wasteland. They couldn't find their way to a city or town. They were hungry and thirsty. Their lives were slipping away. So they cried out to the Lord in their distress, and God delivered them from their desperate circumstances. God led them straight to human habitation. God turns rivers into desert, watery springs into thirsty ground, fruitful land into unproductive dirt when its inhabitants are wicked. But God can also turn the desert into watery pools, thirsty ground into watery springs where he settles the hungry. They even build a city there. They plant fields and vineyards and obtain a fruitful harvest. From 1 Thessal Thessalonians, you remember, brothers and sisters, our efforts and hard work. We preached God's good news to you while we worked night and day so we wouldn't be a burden on any of you. You and God are witnesses of how holy, just, and blameless we were toward you believers. Likewise, you know how we treated each of you like a father treats his own children. We appealed to you, encouraged you, and pleaded with you to live lives worthy of the God who is calling you into his own kingdom and glory. We also thank God constantly for this. When you accepted God's word that you heard from us, you welcomed it for what it truly is. Instead of accepting it as a human message, you accepted it as God's message, and it continues to work in you who are believers. From Matthew 23, then Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples. The legal experts and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, you must take care to do everything they see, but don't do what they do. For they tie together heavy packs that are impossible to carry, put them on the shoulders of others, but are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do, they do to be noticed by others. They make extra wide prayer bands for their arms and long tassels for their clothes. They love to sit in places of honor at banquets and in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with honor in the markets and to be addressed as rabbi. But you shouldn't be called rabbi because you have one teacher and all of you are brothers and sisters. Don't call anybody on earth your father because you have one father who is heavenly. Don't be called teacher because Christ is your one teacher. But the one who is greatest among you will be your servant. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, but all who make themselves low will be lifted up. Herein lies wisdom. So this sermon this morning, I have borrowed from uh, the Reverend Dalton Rushing. And I have this with permission from dayone.org, and it is a broadcast for this Sunday, November 5th, 2023. He also is a United Methodist minister, which means as United Methodist, as Methodist, part of the conglomeration of the United Church is Methodism. So you're getting to hear a little of your, your combined church. So Reverend Dalton says, some Oh, Fiona, you're going to Sunday school. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I want the children to come back during the communion liturgy, so they're going out to do their Sunday school now. 
He says, some years ago as an experiment, instead of giving up chocolate or alcohol for the 40 days of the season of Lent, he decided to give up his anonymity, which is to say, he says, I spent most of that 40 days wearing a black clergy shirt and a white clerical collar everywhere I went. And he says, as a United Methodist pastor, my denomination does have a tradition of clergy wearing collars, but it isn't super common. Certainly there are fewer collars in United Methodist churches than you'll find in Lutheran or Episcopal churches or more famously Roman Catholic churches. As a result, he says, it was a unique experience for me to wear the collar to the grocery store or the gas station, the funeral home and the school lobby. I especially loved it when I was out with my two elementary aged daughters, each holding my hand as puzzled passersby who associated the collar with Roman Catholic priests tried to square their understanding of a celebrate priesthood with the existence of my cute children. It wasn't just these folks who gawked, however. During those 40 days, I had a keen awareness that people treated me differently than they did on days when I wore street clothes. It's not that they treated me better, just different. For every person who held the door open for me and called me father, someone else would sneer and walk away as I'd insulted, as if I'd insulted their mother or kicked their dog. The look I got most often, though, was one of distinct indifference. And I know that I have worn my collar out in public, and that has been my experience when I wear my collar. He says, I do not mean people looked at me and then looked away as one does to strangers on the streets. I mean, and I don't believe I am projecting here, people looked at me with a look that said, you have nothing to offer me and then they went about their business. It was an instructive Lent for me because as a professional Christian, I forget sometimes what the church looks like from the outside. I remember the first house my wife and I moved into. It was a rental and the day we moved in, we noticed that in the guest bedroom, somebody had knocked a basketball sized hole into the drywall and then covered up with duct tape and painted over it. It was not a small hole. And then we lived in that house for three years, and you know the next time I noticed that duct taped covered hole was on the day we moved out. It's amazing how quickly we get acclimated to our surroundings and assume that they are normal. It becomes difficult to properly assess how things are going on inside the church doors when one of the things going on outside the church doors is you. For Christians, this dynamic can be a difficult one to navigate. The world is changing. The church is changing. As with the last two millennia worth of Christians, we've all got to figure out how to be faithful in this new age. And I have to be honest, he says, I'm starting to wonder if the indifference might actually present an opportunity. And these are words that I just spoke this Sunday, this week with someone. I wonder if there's something of this dynamic that could be used for good. And he says, I should qualify what I mean. It isn't fun to be in the mix in this time of change. And I deeply wish all people were as impressed with the gospel of Jesus Christ as I am. But then I don't actually think that the indifference is about the gospel, per se. I suspect the indifference is towards those who tie together heavy packs that are impossible to carry and then put them on the shoulders of others but are unwilling to move a finger to help them. I suspect the indifference is toward those who do everything in order to be noticed by others, those who make extra wide prayer bands for their arms and long tassels for their clothes, those who love to sit in places of honor at banquets and in the markets, who wear a cloak of respectability. I suspect the indifference is about people who look like me. 
I don't think the indifference is actually about the gospel. Because when I read this passage in the Gospel of Matthew, it makes me think that Jesus isn't concerned with respectability. Shall I say that again? Jesus isn't concerned with respectability. It makes me think that Jesus is concerned with faithfulness, not exquisite vestments, not obsequious behavior towards clergy, not even the respectability of the church, but faithfulness to his mission of making disciples, reaching the lost, raising up the lowly, and transforming the world for love. This is not a new problem. The founder of the religious tradition of Methodism, John Wesley, famously kept meticulous journals of his ministry exploits. And in 1739, he documented a trip to Bristol, UK, England, during which he was to share the gospel message with the people there. Instead of preaching in a church or some similarly respectable place, Wesley wrote this on, on April 2nd of that year. At four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation. I submitted to be more vile. What Wesley meant was that the gospel message gets its power from the power of Christ, not the trappings of the church. And so it was that he started preaching in fields and debtors' prisons and mining camps. He preached anywhere anybody would listen, particularly in communities full of people who would never think to step foot inside a church. Now, says Dalton, I lament the decline in church going in his home country, the United States, just as much as anybody. I am sad about the rise of those who declare no religious tradition at all. But I do wonder if this moment presents the church of Jesus Christ with an opportunity to get back to first principles. Not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. He says, I mean, he pre preaches in a robe and a stole most Sundays after all. But to remember that Jesus cares much less about what we wear on the outside and much more about what is written on our hearts. But not only do I think this moment presents an opportunity to refocus, I suspect that this moment in which the trappings of the church have disappeared like the emperor's new clothes in the old fairy tale, I suspect this moment in which our extra-wide prayer bands have been removed and our assumption of respectability discarded, we do have children who dance and sing in the aisles of the, of the, the church. I suspect this moment presents an opportunity for Christian people to more effectively reach out to those who have felt that the church makes no difference in the lives or in the world. And it's an opportunity to have us be the kind of people Jesus would have us to be. In his book, The Beauty of Dusk, on vision lost and found, the New York Times columnist Frank Brunei talks about the ways in which his perspective on life has changed following a stroke, which cut off blood to his right eye, rendering him blind in that eye and with the real possibility that the same thing might happen to the left. That kind of news will rock a person. And yet, if you saw him on the street, you would know, not know what he was up against, just as we do not know what so many people are up against in their personal lives. Brunei describes what he calls the sandwich board theory of life. The sandwich board theory of life. He writes, imagine that each of us donned a sandwich board which itemized all our internal problems, our pain, our demons, our challenges, all of it. I wonder, he said, what, what you would write on your sandwich board. Navigating an anxiety disorder, maybe. Struggling with aging parents, perhaps. Or 
divorced from an unfaithful spouse, or damaged from some long-ago abuse. Maybe it would list an invisible disease that not everyone knows you are dealing with, or an addiction, or the challenges of an unfulfilling job, or a tricky relationship with a child. It would certainly list the sources of your grief. The point, Brunei says, is that if others could see on the outside what we are dealing with on the inside, they would inevitably give us more grace. Forgive the small lapses, as we would in inv inevitably do for others. It would be an exercise in compassion and vulnerability. And my God, does the world need more compassion and vulnerability. He says, this is just me talking, but I don't think I'm advocating for you to put on an actual sandwich board or to take a magic marker to your church clothes. But I do wonder if the cloak of respectability we have wrapped the church in is less a cloak and more a shroud. I wonder what it would look like if we removed the armor we put on in order to keep from having to actually deal with those silent pains and demons. I wonder what it would be like if the Church of Jesus Christ worried less about looking respectable and worried more about being honest in our groping for the love of Jesus Christ and God. We've got work to do if we are going to follow Jesus' command in this chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, that there is a gift in our work. For if we, as Christ's holy church, each of us in our homes, our communities, our schools, our places of business, and yes, even in our church buildings, which we do, if we can stop worrying so much about looking like we have it all together and instead embrace the kind of vulnerability that connects every person in the world, religious or not, with every other person in the world, and as a result, with the heart of God. If we can embrace the vulnerability that comes when we are genuine about our faults and our pain, if we can follow the advice of the great theologian Howard Thurman, who writes, if I hear the sound of the genuine in me, and you hear the sound of genuine in you, it is possible for me to lower myself and come up in you. If we can do that, God will be glorified, for we will be more accurate versions of the people God created us to be, more honest, more open, more faithful. After all, he says, I am reminded that the Gospel of Luke records that Christ was made not known in the mending of the bread, but in its breaking. Amen. We're moving into a time of our pastoral prayer. And I ask you to please take a moment of silence to hold those people you know needing our prayer and for those listed here. And we do ask for prayers for Rob Seamus because he had his appendix removed on Friday. So he needs our prayers for a good recovery. Burn Spear is back home. And of course, we extend our sympathies to Carol and Mike Holes on the passing of Shonay. That memorial will take place on Friday, this Friday the 10th at 2 p.m. And we begin. Teach us the courage, O oh God, to turn from what seems so natural, so safe, the way of grasping power and befriending the powerful in the hope of protection and security. Teach us the humility, O oh God, to turn from what is so enticing, 
so persuasive, the way of accumulating things and trusting in wealth, in the hope of comfort and life. Lead us, O God, in another way, the way of true security, true wealth, the way of Christ, the servant, the way of weakness and simplicity. Lead us, O God, in another way, the way of caring for the neglected, feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, protecting the threatened, and challenging the pow powerful, the foolish way of the gospel that brings salvation to all. And now our call to reconciliation before we approach the communion table. We know how easy it is to do exactly the opposite of what we learned from our teacher, Jesus. So let us draw near to our God, for in, our, in confessing our failures, we will discover the grace and mercy God has in store for us. And join, in we, and join with me in praying. When we come to the edge of your holiness, constant love we know we have not lived as your own we dam up for ourselves your rivers of love while the lives around us turn into deserts of loneliness all too quickly we place our feet on the quicksand of fear not wanting to step across to your faith we tie up our angers and worries and burden our families and friends with them. Forgive us, listener to our hearts. By your patient grace, give us more time to practice our calling to discipleship so we might learn all we need to live as sisters and brothers of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the good news. God hears you. God forgives you. God is with you as you journey into the land, that land called promise. And we say together, this is the great news. Amen. And now we're coming to our time of offering. And uh, I will offer our prayer, and then the ways that you can give will be on the screen. I dwell upon the goodness in my life. Thank you. I cherish in my heart your gift to me. Thank you. I notice the blessings of life, breath, loving, and sharing. I am so very grateful, and I respond to your love with this gift today. Jennifer, we will sing, God help us to treasure.
May the God of the table be with you. And our hearts. And also with you. Let us offer our hearts to God. God hears our hearts and answers with love and hope. Lift your voices in song to the one who serves us. We will praise God with our voices and lives. When no answer was coming out of the void, you spoke, God of our hearts, calling forth creation in all its beauty. Chipmunks dashing across lawns, eagles soaring over valleys, comets streak streaking night skies. This was brought forth for us, those created in your image, but we longed to live in sin's shadows and so wandered down death's paths. You repeatedly sent prophets to us, women and men who called us to return, but we would not practice what they preached, but continued to play in temptation's yard. Um, could someone let... Mike, no, to come back. Can you do that, Marie? Thanks. So you gave us the answer of your heart, becoming on us, on becoming one of us in Jesus, so we could be filled with your hope. And here in these moments of silence and word, here as we gather at your feast of grace, we join in offering praise to you. Holy, holy, holy are you. God who is with us. All creation joins in singing glory to you. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is one who serves the most vulnerable. Hosanna in the highest. You alone are holy, God who speaks to us, and Jesus is blessed by your love and goodness. Like a father teaching kids to drive, he is your patience with us. Like a brother who shares baking secrets, he is your compassion to us. Like a sister who shows us how to bend the ball, she is your wisdom towards us. Like your mother, like a mother who confronts our deepest fears, God is your life and hope, which comes out of the tomb, having defeated the power of death. As we recall Jesus' life and ministry among people, as we remember his death and resurrection for all, we speak of that faith, which is often a mystery to us. We say, your witness to weakness over power, Jesus died on the cross. Your witness to love overcoming hate, Jesus was raised from death. Your witness to promises yet to be filled, Jesus will come again. As we gather around this table, pour out your spirit upon us. And the gifts of the bread and the cup. As we eat of your brokenness, may we live humbly with others. May we speak with humility to power. As we drink from your grace, may we act humbly in seeking justice. May we serve others with humility and love. And when your light has overcome all shadows, when we are all brought to your table in glory, we will join our sisters and brothers of every time and from every place in praising you forever, God in community, Holy One. And we say together, Amen. So this table does not belong to the United Church of Canada. It belongs to God. So if you are a seeker, if you don't know that you're a seeker, if you came out of curiosity to be here today, you may come and receive these elements, these blessed elements of bread and grape juice, because we use grape juice here. Already, and there are gluten-free options as well. The table is set. You are invited to receive God's grace, and can my servers please come forward? My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear this weed, though far off, you that hails a new creation through.
Let us join together now in um, the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Mother and our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our closing hymn is Voices United, number 481, sent forth by God's blessing. Stand as you are able. All right, the commissioning and the benediction, along with Valley and Fiona. Are you going to help? Or oh, do you want to stand up there? Stand up. Oh, oh, you want, oh, just like a time with children, or a story for all ages. Good idea. Okay, are you ready? Let us go to be witnesses of God's love. We will go in our neighborhoods. We will live it in every moment. Every day. Let us go to be witnesses of Jesus' justice. We will challenge those who harass others. We will help rebuild broken lives and neighborhoods. Let us go to be witnesses of the Spirit's peace. We will embrace the lonely with acceptance and joy. We will fill the empty with wonder and grace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Try to keep your clothes on when you're at the front, okay, feet? service is ended. <laughs>